Hello, I'm Sigrid Thornton. The humble egg. We've been eating them all our lives. But they're high in cholesterol. So does that mean they're also bad for our hearts? Dr Rochford puts his medical know-how where his mouth is. I'm going to eat four eggs a day for two weeks. Is there a limit to how many we should eat? Hypnotherapy. I simply want you to stare at that ring on my finger. Is it an effective treatment for claustrophobia? We have excellent results. Or is it just a big con? I'm not a skeptic and I want to be a believer. The mystery of growing pains. Why do these pains plague some children and not others? Is it all in our imagination? When I hear crying in the night, I, it freaks me out. Or is there something more serious afoot? What's the matter, on My foot. Plus... In the last five years, I've had no injuries, simply because of stretching. Does stretching before exercise really help prevent injury? Or is it just... Oh, stretching the truth? That's a story no self-respecting sports nut should miss. And it's coming up very soon on What's Good For You. Hey, what's good, what's good for you? Did your mama tell you what's good for you? Did your mama tell you what's good for you? What's good for you? Scrambled, poached, hard-boiled, fried. However you like it, eggs have always been a quick fix for a nutritious meal. The average Aussie only eats about three eggs a week, which when you think about it, isn't that many. But is that because eggs are loaded with cholesterol? And we all know that cholesterol is linked to our number one killer, heart disease. Well, tonight I've got a very important question to answer. Are eggs bad for our heart? Since the 1960s, doctors have linked high blood cholesterol with clogged arteries and heart attacks. So avoiding foods rich in cholesterol, like eggs, seems like the right thing to do. Or is it? I'm here at the University of Arizona in the good old US of A because just inside in one of these buildings is one of the leading researchers on cholesterol. And I'm going to go in and find out just how many answers she has to my tricky questions. Let's go and find out. Dr Wanda Howell has analysed over a hundred studies to do with cholesterol. And she's learned that we can't live without it. It's an essential component of every uh, membrane, cell membrane in the body. And that's the reason that our body makes most of the cholesterol that is produced um, and maybe ends up in our bloodstream. We actually make two types of cholesterol to transport saturated fats around the body. LDL, that's the red guy, and HDL, that's the green guy. Now, see what the red guy, Mr LDL, is doing? He's clogging up our artery walls. And the good guy, Mr. HDL? Well, he's cleaning up the mess by helping to excrete saturated fats via the liver. So we want to have high HDL mm -hmm. and low LDL. That's the preferred ratio, okay. yes. Eggs are loaded with cholesterol. But do they have more of the bad stuff or the good stuff? It's time to give this a test. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to eat four eggs a day for two weeks which roughly works out to be about nine times the average Aussie consumption. Now, if my cholesterol goes up, well, that's bad news for me, bad news for the eggs, and I suppose that means they're bad news for your heart. My experiment starts at a cafe that does the best eggs in town. But first of all, I need to check my cholesterol. And as I like to tell my patients, this won't hurt a bit. Here's how this kit works. Drop some blood onto a slip, pop it into this machine, and it reads my cholesterol levels in just three minutes. A reading above four runs on the high side. Anything under four is within the healthy range. Well, there you go. My cholesterol is sitting at 3.8, which is below the Heart Foundation's recommendation of four. I'll use that as my starting point. The best thing about eggs is you never have to eat them the same way twice. And if the French can come up with 700 ways of preparing eggs, I'm going to try every single one of them. What's good for you? Who would have thought? A mother hen turns over her eggs about 50 times a day. And it's not just for exercise. 
she actually does it to prevent the egg yolk from sticking to the sides of the shell. All of which is great for us. It means those little beauties slide straight off the shell into the pan. The swinging pendulum. It's an image that's been associated with hypnosis for centuries. Look into my eyes. Are you feeling sleepy? People with addictions and phobias are increasingly turning to hypnotherapy to solve their problems. But the skeptics, and there are still many, say it's just a con, voodoo science. So tonight, we're putting hypnotherapy in the spotlight. Does it actually work, or is it all in the mind? How are you, dear? Is everything all right? Sleep, deep asleep. <laughs> Sleep, 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 Have you sleep, ever sleep, been to see sleep, Martin sleep, St. James? Sleep, 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 He's very entertaining. Sleep, sleep. Man power! He gets people to do the craziest things under hypnosis. But can the same principle be applied to medical hypnosis? Somebody who goes to a stage show goes to have a, a drink, perhaps, a bit of fun, a bit of entertainment. But in reality, there is very little difference except that I, as a clinical hypnotherapist, want to allow my client to understand that the trance or the hypnosis belongs to them. And therefore, I conduct a partnership. David Kennedy has spent over 40 years as a clinical hypnotherapist in Brisbane. By using hypnosis, he claims to have cured everything from phobias and addictions to stress disorders. I am the facilitator to help this person to access processes of thinking that normally they might not know how to do. Laura is a mum of three who lives in Brisbane and she's got a big problem. When she was three years old, her uncle popped her in a suitcase just for a laugh and that single event triggered the condition we know as claustrophobia, fear of confined spaces. Just watch what happens when she tries to take a lift. I am very nervous and hot and panicky. Well, the reason I want to get this problem sorted out because it's getting worse. I could just feel that my stomach's just tightening and churning, feel sick and listening to the mechanics of the lift. Starting to affect the children because they're starting to fear being in a lift with me because I start to panic. I'm waiting for it to quickly come to the floor because I'm starting to freak out in here. <sighs> I can hear it, it's getting there, and the doors are going to open really soon. I can get out. My mother has been to a hypnotherapist back in the UK and she suggested to me that I should see someone because it's worked for her. So I'm not a sceptic, and I want to be a believer. One of the things that I will discover in what I do with you is how you're able to use your imagination. David's hypnotherapy sessions last for about two hours, and it's time to put Laura under his spell. I simply want you to stare at that ring on my finger. Just take three very big, deep breaths and now focus all your attention on the feeling of your eyes. And you begin to feel a feeling of fatigue in your eyes. And that's fine. Cause your eyes to close. Laura has entered the hypnotic state, a condition not unlike daydreaming. She's mentally and physically relaxed. You'll not only be able to open your eyes, but you'll be able to talk with me, but you are going to remain deeply, comfortably, and profoundly in hypnosis. Now, rather than going directly to the source of her phobia, David wants Laura to first rekindle a past sense of achievement. <clears throat> How's it feel? Very relaxing. Mm -hmm. Laura recalls a time when she was in complete control. As head chef at a top catering firm, wowing her clients with a delicious chicken dish. Just hang on to that image. It was a chicken dish all rolled up with zucchini oh, ribbons. Right. 
a little bit of emotion in that, isn't there? Mm -hmm. You felt it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Recalling that sense of achievement has brought some happy tears. Just put yourself right back there in that day, at that time. But things aren't quite as pleasant when she's forced to go to a darker place, stepping into a lift. The door hasn't opened and you feel yourself tightening up. We'll reenact in the hypnosis an event that is significant to her. And then we will desensitize her to that. And that's exactly how uh, phobias are dealt with using hypnosis. You're taking control of your breathing because that's what you tried to do in the lift, didn't you? Just to quell the panic, to quell the discomfort. David's not toying with Laura's emotions. He's desensitizing her fear of claustrophobia by replacing it with a different emotion, joy. And this comes from none other than her catering triumph. Put yourself in the kitchen. It's like we've joined two wires together. After an emotional session, David's work is done. You can be as alert as you need to be. You can open your eyes and just be here. Laura seems well and good in the clinic. Thanks for that. But what's going to happen when she puts herself in a lift two weeks from now? I'll see how far I can get, and if I have to get out, I'm going to get out. About one in ten Australians, that's two million people, suffer from a phobia. Which are the most common phobias? Tell you after the break. What's good for you? Plus, stretching before exercise. Hamstrings, calves, you know the drill. Is it playing smart? I feel a lot better in the muscles during and after training. Or just a waste of time? I did no stretching at all before the game and I've never been injured. What's good for you? Two million Australians suffer from phobias. The most common is fear of spiders, closely followed by fear of people and social situations, fear of flying, and fear of open spaces. Claustrophobia comes in at number five. Recognise this pose? That's right, I'm stretching my muscles and it's pretty familiar to anyone who plays sport. Before we go out to battle, we limber up with a series of stretches, hamstrings, calves, you know the drill. The idea being, we don't want to tear or strain a muscle, so we give them a bit of a workout first. But does it work? Is stretching before exercise really going to prevent injury? Or is it just, oh, stretching the truth? Stretch mania took off at the very first modern Olympic Games in Athens in 1896. But stretching really made its mark in the 40s. Since then it's just been something that's been perpetuated uh, by fitness training circles. Rod Pope studies health and fitness at Charles Sturt University in Wagga Wagga. He's carried out some breakthrough tests on stretching using more than 2,000 army recruits. The results on those a bit later. But what about the people at the pointy end of all this stretch mania? Let's start with the guys at Sydney's Radio Physics Cricket Club. Yeah, despite the uh, pre-match stretching, I've had hamstring problems, Achilles problems. In the last five years, I've had no injuries, similarly because of stretching. I do no stretching at all before the game and I've never been injured. I don't know, I've, I've always been quite good with not stretching, so I don't know whether it's a benefit or not. So the jury's right out there on this one. None of the guys know whether stretching before the game is going to help them during the game. So before they get going today, I've asked for their help. Half of them, this group over here, they're having a proper stretch. Keep going, guys. And the other half, well, let's just say this pre-match warm-up, that went out with the handlebar moustache. <laughs> And out they go. Good luck, fellas. While the lads take to the cricket pitch, 
I'm actually going to play a set of tennis against my mate Tony over here. He's having a stretch. I'm not. In fact, the only exercise I'm doing before the match is this. Hey, luck, Tone. Well played, mate. Really okay. enjoyed that. That was fabulous. Now, listen, you were the one who did all the stretching beforehand. How do you feel now? I feel fine. A bit hot, yeah. sweaty, but uh, there's no pulls, no injuries, no strains. Okay, so you've, did you feel any benefit from the stretching, do you think? Well, I don't know. I saw your warm up. I think <laughs> I prefer yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great go. Okay, great. Thanks, great mate. go. No tennis elbow for Tony or me, and the cricketers? It's game over, and no one from either group is limping off the field. How's that? Health and fitness expert Rod Pope carried out two studies similar to the one we just did. Except his was on a massive scale. He used 2,600 army recruits as his guinea pigs. The soldiers were put through 50 hours of training, one group stretched before each session of exercise. The control group did no warm-ups at all. And the result? The results of our study showed that it really made no difference whether soldiers stretched or not. They were both, both groups were injured at the same rate. So does that mean we shouldn't stretch at all? It's quite important to differentiate between stretching during warm-up and warm-up itself. And uh, there's some evidence that warm-up is quite, quite important to prevent injury in athletes. Uh, but stretching is just one component of a warm-up. And so when we say that stretching is probably not of much value, we need to be careful not to throw out uh, warm-up along with stretching. So just stretching, making sure that this, this hip is straight. So the muscle Physiotherapist Claire Walsh is on the same track as Rod Pope. I think it's fairly well recognised now through the research that stretching before you play sport doesn't necessarily prevent you from injuring yourself while you're playing sport on that, at the, in that game. But I think that improving your flexibility overall in the long term can definitely prevent injury because it prevents muscle imbalances occurring. Claire also happens to be the physio for the Sydney Swans. And with a little help from her friends, she's going to show us the do's and don'ts of warming up. I've got Chris and Matt with me, two of our younger Swans players. They're going to help me go through some of the things that we need to do to warm up and stretch before they go on to the field to play sport. Yeah, and just maybe even... just you could probably... Stretching isn't the same as warming up. You need to get those muscles heated by, say, running on the spot or gently jogging. Then go for a stretch, but not a static stretch like Matt. Stretches should be dynamic, have some movement in them, like Chris is doing. And finally, remember to cool down with some stretches. Has this regime helped the Swans? I used to warm up less before coming here to the Sydney Swans, and now that warm-up's longer, I feel, feel a lot better in the muscles during and after training. Well, if it's good enough for the Swans, it ought to be good enough for the rest of us. So there you go. At least now I know the rights and wrongs of stretching. And this is what I recommend to all you sports nuts. When you get on the field of play, make sure you do a warm-up. Jog up and down on the spot, run around the block, hit a few balls, anything. Just make sure you get the circulation going first before you do your stretches. It'll give you a better than even chance of surviving that nasty thing we call exercise. So there is a place for stretching. Just don't let it become the only match preparation you do. Make the stretch one part of a bigger warm-up. Now, for many Australians, exercise can be a very dangerous game indeed. I'll tell you just how dangerous when we return. Plus, Laura, the hypnotherapy student, faces her fears. Here we go. 32 floors and up. Hey, what's good? What's good for you? Every year in Australia, there are more than 5 million sports-related injuries. And 250,000 of those result in hospital admissions. Why the high number? Maybe it's because less than 40% of us actually bother with warm-ups and cool-downs. I'm 
I'm trying to find out if eggs contain good or bad cholesterol. To do that, I've been eating four eggs a day for the past fortnight, and I've found the perfect company to do my second cholesterol test with. This guy eats a lot of eggs. I mean, a lot of eggs. 18 a day. Oscar McGill is an 18-year-old bodybuilder who's training for the world titles. And he prefers his eggs blended in a shake. How do you afford to pay for 18 eggs a day? Well, there's a farm over there, I get them for free. You get them for free? Yeah. yeah that probably makes it a little bit easier for yes, you. Yes, it does. Do you like eggs? They're all right in the blender. But you wouldn't eat them otherwise? I would, yeah. So that's the only way that you tend to eat them? Yes. OK. Each to his own. But what I really want to know is do eggs raise or lower our cholesterol? Well, Oscar, I think we put it to the test. I'm going first. Now, a reading above four will mean a high cholesterol level. A reading under four is healthy. Two weeks ago, my first reading was under four. A great result. Five, four. But what will the second test reveal? Yeah, <laughs> low. Wow, my cholesterol levels have actually fallen under 3.8. So low, the machine doesn't have a number for it. Yeah, so they're not, not, not bad for you, they're actually good for you. You could draw that conclusion. Mm. You bet they are. But just to make doubly sure, I'm going to test Oscar's cholesterol level as well. Now, now, this won't hurt much. Now, remember, he eats 18 eggs a day. Perfect. Another great result from a guy whose diet is totally dominated by eggs. Mm, I got up to 24 now. Well, that may be a little excessive. Maybe. Eggs are rich in nutrients, low in fat, and high in protein. But you shouldn't eat so many that you miss out on other nutritional goodies. My next question is this. If eggs are so good for us, what are the foods causing all the damage? contributing to high cholesterol and therefore causing heart disease. Dietitian Sharon Natoli lays the blame at the feet of saturated fats. Well, saturated fat's the type of fat that increases the level of cholesterol in your bloodstream, so that's the type that um, really makes a difference in terms of health if you can cut that down. And we know that the average Australian um, diet contains twice as much saturated fat as what's ideal. Saturated fats are often in foods that we love to eat. Cakes, full cream dairy products, fatty meats and takeaways. And here's how they wreak havoc. Saturated fats cause the body to produce more LDL. Remember the red guys? LDL is bad cholesterol. And the more we produce, the more clogged up our arteries become. And the harder the green guys, or HDL, have to work to clean up the mess. When it gets too hard, heart attacks can result. About 70 people in Australia will have a heart attack every day. And cholesterol, bad cholesterol, is one of the main risk factors for having these heart attacks. Brisbane cardiologist Dr Karam Kostner believes that eating eggs can actually lower cholesterol levels because they're high in cholesterol but low in saturated fats. <laughs> that most people who eat a lot of eggs actually shut down their, pro their body's production of cholesterol. So the more eggs somebody eats, the less cholesterol our body produces. And that's why most people who eat a lot of eggs don't get heart disease necessarily from eating eggs. If you've got a high cholesterol reading, you can reduce it by up to 30% in less than six weeks, simply by modifying your diet, including plenty of high fibre foods, lean meats and low fat dairy. So it's good news for the chooks, and it's good news for egg lovers. Eating eggs won't give you high cholesterol. In fact, eggs are full of high quality protein, vitamins and minerals, and should be a part of any healthy diet. But on a more serious note, if you don't know your blood cholesterol, take my advice and go and get it checked. It's one of the most important and simple ways to ensure that you prevent health problems in the future. Next time you're buying eggs, consider this. There's no difference nutritionally or taste-wise between white eggs and brown eggs. White-shelled eggs are produced by hens with white feathers and the hens with red feathers produce brown-shelled eggs. An average hen lays about 300 eggs a year 
and the older the hen gets, the bigger their eggs. What's good for you? And I simply want you to stare. Does hypnotherapy work? Or is it all in the mind? And you begin to feel a feeling of fatigue in your eyes. Two weeks ago, hypnotherapist David Kennedy spent two hours trying to cure Laura of her claustrophobia. Now it's time to find out if the treatment worked or failed. It's really hard to say whether hypnosis has cured me because I haven't been in a situation yet where I can react. I haven't been in a lift, but once I've had the, a test and gone in, up in a lift, I'd be interested to see how I go. Previously, Laura couldn't enter a lift without having a meltdown. What's going to happen when she's forced to take one of the tallest lifts in Brisbane? The AMP building is 32 storeys high. Here we go. 32 floors and up. 